Um, thanks, everybody. Um, apologies that um, Richard couldn't be here today, and I've, I've stepped in to deliver. And I, I wanted intentionally to deliver what he would have said, as to some extent, you, you know, um, he was um, um, somebody who you'd come to hear. But um, I will clearly do it for anybody that knows Richard um, with a very different accent. So um, <laughs> if you um, bear with me on that, and as we go through this, I think. Look, I, I think Tim set the scene um, perfectly, and, and it, it really continued in the, the discussion in the Q&A that followed. Um, I think we all agree, and probably why we're all here, is that um, the food system needs to change. Um, if you look beyond where we are today, and, I'll, and I will come back to it as I talk about this, you know, where we are today with very, very real um, prescient pressures on the current cost of living crisis, um, it's clear that we all need to work together um, to address you know, absolutely crucial challenges um, um, that are um, about ensuring that at a planet level um, it remains habitable um, and we're able to mitigate the impacts that are already happening from climate change. So how do we get back to sort of almost net positive from that perspective? Again, it was, it was mentioned earlier, but we need to recognise um, Food's direct responsibility for global warming, um, given that it accounts for um, about 26% of greenhouse gas emissions. And with that in mind and the scale of that challenge, we need to take a long-term strategic approach that will help drive um, the creation of a more diverse, a more flexible and resil resilient food system than the one we've seen um, today. Um, I've worked in food um, and the food system now for 20 years. And I, and I probably didn't understand what resilience meant for a long part of my career. Um, and even in the last five, six years, resilience can seem like a very um, ethereal, theoretical concept. I see it every day now, and, I, and, and, I, and I'm absolutely certain I see a food system that is on the edge every single day, has no capacity um, and not really any capability to deal with um, with change, with um, degradation, with something stepping out of that side of the norm, and yet we face bigger challenges than we ever have. So at a personal level, um, I, I, I live and breathe resilience every day, and it's, um, and it's not much fun um, in terms of what you spend your time doing, it's, um, but it's, it's the reality. Um, Again, it's come up already uh, in terms of what we've talked about today. Industrialised agriculture has shown itself to be brilliant at developing, marketing and delivering cheap food to consumers, um, but at huge environmental cost. And that, whether that's in the UK and degradation of soils or decimation of our own wildlife or in the wipeout of tropical rainforests across Asia, South America, and, you know, Brazil in particular. So what can Iceland as a business do against challenges of that scale? Um, Iceland isn't a small business. Um, we're a turnover this year of about four billion pounds. Um, but actually, in the context of the UK grocery market, um, Iceland is a minnow and sort of you know barely registers. We're just two and a half percent um, of the UK grocery market. And if you think about us in the in a global context, um, um, you know we'll register somewhere, but not on any chart or graph that anybody's typically looking at. Um, but Actually, you know, through the history of the business, it's a privately owned business, we've proved um, that we can make a difference by taking disruptive action. Um, inspired by his reading of Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring, um, Sir Malcolm Walker um, went to war against what he described, and if anybody knows Malcolm, they could probably picture this, what he described as Frankenstein food um, at the end of the 1990s, and he pledged to remove um, genetically modified ingredients from all of Iceland's own label products. He was told that was impossible and he couldn't do it, um, and he promptly went and did it. Um, and with consumer sentiment, you know, clearly that became the norm, and every other UK food retailer um, followed exactly the same path. Um, ag again, around the same time, uh, he became concerned, and concern was growing around CFCs and their impact on the ozone layer. At that point, Iceland was um, the biggest appliance business in the UK in terms of selling fridges and freezers, and the business partnered with Greenpeace and launched um, environmentally friendly appliances under a, a green freeze brand. And again, with consumer sentiment around the issue, um, those appliances and that approach um, became com a complete industry standard. 
So when, when Richard um, moved up through the business and, and took over um, sustainability issues in Iceland in, in 2018, he knew from what he'd seen in the business that actually, even though we're small, we could make a difference um, if we shouted loudly enough and caused disruption around issues that we felt um, really mattered. And, and, you know, and a great example of that clearly was the work we did on um, palm oil. And Richard had visited Borneo um, in 2017, appalled by what he saw in terms of the impact of um, uh, palm oil monoculture growth um, and the impact on habitats of endangered species like orangutans, but also the devastation on the livelihoods of, of local communities and people. And it was clear that that insatiable um, increase in demand for palm oil um, uh, within um, global food systems was um, really destroying rainforests, habitats, and moving from really species-rich places um, and, and places that are carbon sinks um, into places that are becoming um, net carbon emitters, so a, a real issue. Coming out of that and deciding to ban palm oil on all of Iceland's products um, was a, a, a really brave stance. And, and I guess the question we continue to ask ourselves is, how much difference did we really make by doing that and making that announcement? We generated lots of publicity. Um, the, the Rangtang advertisement that, that Iceland did, which they borrowed from Greenpeace, was the most um, watched Christmas ad of all time without ever actually being broadcast on commercial television. Um, Google searches for palm oil sword. Um, lots of people wrote into the business. Lots of school children wrote in enthusiastically backing um, the campaign and what we were doing. The Malaysian government um, was spooked enough to launch a um, personal campaign against Richard of um, surveillance and um, an advertising campaign against them. So we know that we, we raised the issue up the agenda, um, drew lots of um, attention to it. Um, hopefully, I am encouraged um, promises of greater work and environmental responsibility um, within the palm oil system, but did we actually deliver any real embedded change? And, I th and, and we don't think so. You know, um, we, we know that the reality is it's only governments and entire markets and supply chains that can come together um, to change the food system. So, and that's about businesses, that's about investors. Um, and it's about governments working together across complete global supply chains. Iceland being privately owned um, is, a, is a sort of um, in its ownership and, and I guess within the business, we're, we're unabashed, we're capitalists, um, we're free marketeers, but equally Richard and, you know, and the business recognise that the, the environmental and social issues that we're trying to, to achieve and challenge will not be Will, will never be solved by the free market um, and will not certainly ever be solved at the pace they need to be solved at. And again, we heard today, today earlier about the pace of change that we need. Um, and, we, you know, and, it's, and again, it's easy to say this from sitting on the outside of the specific issues, but you know, we, we look at it and go, would house builders have, have ever volunteered um, to stop installing um, new gas and oil boilers by 2025? Would car manufacturers have ever pledged to stop selling diesel and petrol cars by 2030 if, if government hadn't stepped in and regulated them to do so? So decisive government um, action is really necessary to stimulate the market, to stimulate technological um, innovation and enable those sorts of goals to be met. And there needs to be a, sim a sort of similar willingness and ambition um, around setting parameters for the food industry and the food system to drive new approaches you know, around sourcing, around transparency, we've heard a lot about transparency earlier, and, and importantly, um, to shift consumer behaviour towards more sustainable out, um, sort of outcomes and solutions. And if you think of just one prime example, and, and certainly one that we think about, is um, the, the level of urgent action that's needed to halt um, soy-driven deforestation in Brazil. And that's, you know, that can't be done by UK government alone, but it, it needs international policy coordination for something so big. And no one business can do this on its own. And it, it's an area of, of um, has been pressing need for a long time. It goes back to Tim's point. Um, the slides haven't changed. We, we've seen this for a long time coming, but we're still there. From Iceland's perspective, it's, it's, it's arguably easy for the better off to do their bit. Um, when it comes to the planet, um, be, be that by you know, 
cliched response but by going organic or eating more local, local produce. You know, the challenge for Iceland, as we see it, the challenge for the industry and society is how do we take with us the multitude, the people who shop in value supermarkets and who are absolutely finding feeding their family a weekly, daily struggle. And that struggle has been significantly worsened over the last year by the, the um, surge in the cost of living dr driven by soaring global energy prices and um, following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And actually, you know, another sad aspect of that is ironically, or, or, or depends what position you take, you know, from an Iceland point of view, we've had to revert out of being palm oil free on a number of products into using, yes, certified sustainable palm oil. But we, we do that because there isn't um, sunflower oil available, which is the, the technical option. And you end up in a choice of, do you stop selling those products for customers at a time of need? Um, or do you revert back in, um, on those products back into um, palm oil and, and you, you face into it and make a, um, a, a sort of an unpleasant choice. Um, and it goes back to, again, Tim talked about there are no, um, there are rarely sort of good answers in this. It's, it's, the, it's, um, it's just making choices. So how do we get people who are trying to feed their family on, you know, typically 25 pound a week to adopt a diet that would be better for their own health um, and the health of the planet? Well, we, we know it's not about lecturing them. Um, and telling people what's good for them. Um, we never get anywhere by doing that. Um, we also believe, and you know, that there'll be controversy around us, we believe there are um, severe limits about what can be achieved by sort of singular fiscal incentives, um, or by, you know, from our point of view, by changing the, the ways that food products are promoted, advertised and displayed. You can, we would characterize it as, you know, you can make um, burgers more expensive and you can make carrots cheaper but if people want to eat burgers, people want to eat burgers. Um, um, we've got to make the alternatives more appealing, and, we, and we've got, it's about um, how, do you, how do you get people um, interested and, and wanting the alternative as opposed to feeling like they're penalised into it. We've seen that um, in developing and launching a, a frozen vegan range, and, and sort of from our point of view, famously a no, a no bull burger. Um, which really launched that range and we've continued to develop and grow that working in partnership with the Live Kindly Collective as we try to um, bring ve you know, a vegan range through into Iceland, which again is not where you might necessarily expect you'd see a vegan range. Um, and equally for eight years now we've been um, working closely, devising, manufacturing, developing um, meals, soups, sauces with Slim and World. Um, now Slim World as a, um, as a sort of a founding principle um, want all of their members to freshly prepare all of their food. But actually, we're there for whenever they just don't have time to do that. And they, they don't uh, have enough time to prepare stuff. They, our products are there to support them. And we get constant feedback from Slimmers and how we are helping and playing a part in um, their progress um, to achieve their health goals. And we do that whilst they keep trying to support that principle with Slim World, where we'll actually have the recipe for the product that we sell on the pack so that um, the customer buying it also has the opportunity going forward to make that for themselves. And again, at Iceland we can sometimes feel sort of slightly put upon um, and middle class commentators as we would see it might look down on Iceland um, and look down on frozen food in general and, and the perceptions around frozen food are really challenging. But <clears throat> it might surprise those commentators, it might surprise everybody actually um, we, we sell a really high proportion of frozen food, so going back to one of the many nutrient profile models and the one that underpins HFSS, if you look at that, 89% of what we sell is classified as healthy, and, and probably that isn't the perception walking in the door of Iceland. But frozen food has more potential than that, it's certainly from a point of view of really going beyond healthy eating into helping people on really tight budgets and also reducing food waste, which is critically important. But to give you a sense of the challenge, whilst in the context of the, the, the um, cost of living crisis, we've done great work in terms of investing in prices, holding lots of um, one pound price point value lines, including um, all of our frozen veg from that perspective. We've worked with our suppliers to um, update all of our packaging to lead the way um, on introducing air fry cooking instructions. Air fry is a, a really economic um, cooking method in terms of saving people money. Um, and trying to make that, ma how do you make that mass market was a challenge for us and we've done that in terms of putting that on all of our packaging. We're currently working and um, have been working for some time with Marcus Rashford and the Food Foundation on trying to, and, and lots of other retailers on trying to promote healthy start and best start. 
um, for people, and we've got information on how to access Healthy Start and Best Start on what will be the equivalent of over 150 million packs a year across milk, frozen fruit, um, veg, fresh fruit and veg, and also on our delivery vans. But whenever um, we tried giving away um, t huge volumes of fresh vegetables as part of Healthy Start, we only saw 15% take up from people. Um, and um, families were telling us and, you know, um, that they didn't have a freezer um, or they just didn't know what to do with the frozen veg. Um, and, and that's the tough reality. You know, there's so many factors at play here. And if we, we you know, and poverty and food poverty is, is absolutely one of them. Um, we know that thousands of people are missing meals on a daily basis. Many people we speak to about trying to eat healthy food, um, we describe it as they live in a food desert. Um, they'll rely on a convenience shop um, that's really close by or a takeaway food shop or you know, a Chinese takeaway, a chippy. Um, that's their main source of, of food because it's close by. And, and actually the weekly shop at the supermarket um, is a taxi journey is expensive um, and just isn't um, how they shop and, and eat on a daily basis. I, and you know, in Iceland, is that we're, we're fundamentally a high street retailer. We're not out of town. We're not um, typically stores with car parks. So we've got lots of people coming to us on the bus or on foot, um, and, and and that's just part of you know um, how we have to work with those people. We offer um, uh, free home delivery, but it's not free home delivery for online customers. It's free home delivery for people actually come into the shop, it, as we try to acknowledge and work with the, um, the circumstances they come to visit our stores in. Right now, in, in terms of what we hear from customers, is we hear about people who avoid stocking up on frozen food um, because of the risk of not having enough money to put in their energy prepay meter. And, and suddenly, if you, you know, you've got the risk of losing all of that money you've invested and, bought and put in frozen food, and actually you just, you, um, um, whilst um, uh, from a, an investor fund point of view, we think about risk a lot at the individual point of view as they manage risk, they just, avoid and opt out of that risk. Um, and that's a real challenge. We, th we think about the, you know, the benefits of frozen food, but when you're dealing with that, that really brings life the challenge. So really we need systemic solutions. You know, how do we optimize um, to give people access to local shops, good food, and the skills and knowledge and awareness um, they need to help feed their families well. And to achieve societal change, it's about the whole food industry. It's about um, wider businesses and investors, but it's about the wider country and nation. How do we work together under str a strong, clear, and consistent governmental lead? When governments do intervene, and, um, and they do, um, their actions need to be well thought through, well implemented, um, and encouraging co um, consumers to make positive change to their eating habits rather than just hitting people in their pockets. We, we all see and, um, and are clear on the issues with obesity um, and, and support the principles around addressing high fat, salt, sugar foods. But um, as a business, we're unconvinced that um, what's just happened in the sort of wholesale reorganisation reorganisi of um, the nation's supermarkets, England's supermarkets initially, to put some high fat, salt, um, sugar foods in less accessible locations um, will do anything to address obesity. Um, and yet, because um, cu customers will seek out the food they want, and that whole process of reorganizing and repositioning stuff within the shop um, costs the industry hundreds of millions of pounds, um, and that's an industry already under, and a system already under cost pressures, and, and that money will go somewhere, and the challenge is, how does it not end up um, being passed on to the consumer who's already really hard pressed from a cost point of view? And what might seem even more controversial, if you think about right now, you know, we are in the eye of the storm um, from a cost of living cr um, crisis point of view, and we don't think that right now, today, you would not um, restrict, restrict multi-buys on high fat, salt, sugar foods right now, today, in the middle of the cost of living crisis, um, because we know that people are already struggling and restricting the amount of food they buy and eat, whether they want to or not. Um, so actually, for us, ensuring customers c can eat um, takes the highest priority, and for us, is that is a higher priority than what would seem right now to the consumer as them being penalised towards being healthier. 
um, because they they cannot afford to be penalised towards being healthier as things stand right now. We're dealing with really complex issues um, and and hopefully we've brought some of that alive. And and to do that, um, investors really need to take the time to understand the pressures on consumers and, and businesses alike. And that's about really getting under the skin of businesses. There's no point in um, just focusing on, and I, when we see this, there is no point on just focusing on sort of ESG KPI scorecards. Um, what, there's no point focusing on Iceland sells 89% of um, uh, food deemed as healthy by the MP, MPM calculator. Um, there's no point focusing on just a, a scope three number from a carbon point of view. You, you've, you've got to invest the time actually to get under the skin and behind the numbers in businesses to really understand the business, its customers, its wider supply chain. And that time spent by both parties will be well spent. To achieve real long-term change, we need businesses, investors, and governments to work together on a, a global basis. And actually, from what we see right now, we can't even get governments to work together on a, a UK basis. Um, if you take HFSS um, and um, the forthcoming um, deposit return schemes, um, we have UK and the devolved nation governments just grinding together. And what we're certain about is they are failing deliver, to deliver schemes that produce the best solutions for health um, and the environment or minimize the cost pressures in delivering those schemes. That is, we, we see that every day. We've missed a huge opportunity to create a single UK-wide DRS that would have, could, have, could have and would have worked in harmony with curbside collection, reduced inconsistency, um, drove up um, collections, um, reduced confusion and reduced cost in businesses. Um, and it looks likely in terms of where we're heading now on deposit return schemes that we will have four different systems within what is fundamentally a relatively small landmass of the UK, each with its own requirements. And if you take DRS in Scotland, um, it's due to launch on August the 16th, which is no time. And as we stand here today, um, we don't know whether the 20p deposit um, will include VAT. And, and actually, to run a business, that's pretty fundamental. And it's incredible that we don't know that. And equally, as we stand today, um, right now we have Scottish government advice that says the price um, at the point um, at shelf needs to be displayed as the price of the product and a separate price for the deposit. Um, UK Trade and Standards, which actually own the legislation for the whole of the UK, says the opposite and says actually you need to display a single price um, at the shelf edge. That might seem sort of a, a trifle of sort of, you know, um, a niche sort of argument um, of no matter to anyone, but it really matters because you've got an IT system that sits behind all of this. <laughs> Um, and, it's, it's, and, and, and we've got to do better than that. We're totally supportive of extended producer responsibility and the principle of producer pays coming through in, in wider environmental legislation. Um, but actually, we're still awaiting clarification on the rules. And the rules around the data collection came in force on the 1st of January. So we're up and running, and we're in a system that, already, that still has lots of clarifications that don't exist. Again, we've got to do better. And in the same way, um, across a, a, a couple of areas where fiscal incentives are, um, are already in place, um, be that plastic tax, um, where we'd like to see more of a closed loop approach, where that money being raised is being invested in UK recycling infrastructure so that it's, it's cheaper and easier to recycle in the UK than the current situation is, which is that the majority of our waste is exported and, and, um, and hopefully recycled in less regulated less more opaque markets that are more open to abuse. And the frustration is that with extended producer responsibility and producer pays coming through, that has still not been addressed as an issue. And the same way when we look at um, the sugar tax, we would have liked to have seen that tax, as opposed to just going into HMRC, we would like to have seen that um, tax used for public health incentives and really being used and gathered to sort of drive a, a more circular approach to addressing the issues. So we know that Look, supermarkets and, and brands can do a lot. We can work in partnership, um, competition law permitting, um, and we can work with the public sector and the third sector in, in trying to um, really bring through innovation in service models and products to address these issues. Um, but equally, it, we need to go in, in lots of other places. That goes right through to, and we, you know, in the context of what I talked about earlier, um, fixing local planning legislation to work against how do you know we can't have food deserts where actually your only access to food is through a takeaway um, or a very small convenience store 
We've got to develop an education policy that skills up the next generation of parents to have a great relationship and awareness and understanding with healthy and sustainable food. And we've got to create the, the funding um, uh, streams to support and underpin that to build those communities uh, schools, uh, skills. Sorry. Um, we're here with the Food Foundation today. And I guess um, in the context, and it's been mentioned earlier, the, the Food Data Transparency Partnership, we will certainly challenge DEFRA, but we challenge the Food Foundation that in, the in, in how it's been set up. Um, whilst um, there is a forum um, for the consumer within the Food Data Transparency Partnership, actually it needs more than that. It should be an equitable working group as per the other. You know, the idea that the consumer is not as important as data it is just wrong. The consumer should be there um, with a full working group um, with a really broad imp input from actual consumers. That was one of the real strengths and we saw the value and the insight of that within David Dimbleby's um, original review. That said, with all of that in mind and sort of in, in closing, um, we are we're optimists um, by our nature. So we are, we are absolutely optimistic that the Food Data Transparency Partnership um, will enab enable all of us to sort of start afresh, um, work together more closely um, as businesses, with wider stakeholders, with government, to create that core shared view of the information, which is really important, um, a core shared view of the insights, and, and therefore um, working forward from that to what are the right interve interventions that we all need to make to drive and deliver change um, and the change that we need in the future. Thank you. And we'll take some uh, questions. If anyone's got any questions, their hands gone straight up. So, yes, please do pose your question to Stuart now. The mic will be on its way. Um, just while we're waiting, very quickly, Stuart, you've had this focus on palm oil. Where would you see the next action uh, to be taken immediately in terms of kind of products or, or strategies? It, if, if I could, this would be me speaking personally. Um, uh, it would be, and, and this is, it, and I'll try not to go on because it, it, it is a personal bugbear. Is carrier bags? Um, carrier bags is a great example of an issue for Britain that goes beyond the data. We all and everybody has switched off on it because we've got a carrier bag tax on single-use carrier bags. Fantastic. You look at the data, and it says we um, use less single-use carrier bags. Massive reduction in single-use carrier bags. I, I, what the sad reality is, what that actually means is that. Um, we put more plastic onto the market than we ever have because um, everybody just now sells heavy weight reusable bags. Nobody wakes up in the morning and needs another carrier bag. Um, but, but equally, lots of times when you're in a shop at a till, you suddenly think, I could do with a bag. Um, and it's a great example. You know, the model is broken. Um, and, it's, and we sit and everybody does great campaigns where they'll sit and go, it's, the answer is a compostable bag. The answer is a paper bag, and the answer is a, a bag made from recovered ocean plastic. None of you know it's the wrong question. You know they are not the answer. Um, the answer is we've got to have less bags, and we we we've got to find it. You know it, we need a closed loop system, um, where you've got the ability to um, have bags but not create an endless amounts of bags. It's got to be a return and reuse system, um, and and yet we're not there because. We've let the data blind us. We think it's jo job done. It's very hard to get engagement in this sort of issue, um, but it, it's a good example of we've got to get past it into you know rebuilding the system. You know the system has locked us into this world, and we, we've got to break that system and start afresh. Thank you, Stuart. Um, let, let's have that question. Yeah. Hi, George Collison, Collison Associates. You've spoken quite a lot about the sort of more consumer end and selling in the supermarket. Um, what is Iceton doing sort of across its supply chain to work with farmers to increase this, the sort of supply and security of fresh produce? So sort of looking at what Tim Benton said in the first sort of opening keynote speech, we've got increasing risks with climate, with uh, weather, with soils degrading, which is sort of pushing a lot of farmers who would otherwise all currently do produce a lot of fresh produce. Farmers, at the end of the day, are gamblers. You plant something, you wait two to 11 months, depending on crop, and then you harvest. If you compare a simple fresh produce item, potatoes, to a field of wheat, uh, one hectare of potatoes, you will be gambling several thousands of pounds, whereas with a hectare of wheat, you might only be gambling 1, 1,000, 1,500. Um, so as you get a bad year, 
uh, or in fact a good year uh, where a price might be high or where you had a long-term contract and you had a good price in your contract which would give you security but then suddenly you get told that you're grading out having 60% so 40% of the profit objective which is quite a difficult practice because processes will want to buy the market. What are you sort of doing to try and work with your suppliers to encourage them to stay in those more risky markets, which is the fresh produce? That okay, let me take that question. What are you doing to stick I, I, with your it's suppliers? It's really, I suppose, a, a really short answer actually to that, which is about consolidating our supply base and working with fewer people on a longer, more stable basis. That the, the fresh produce market is a great example beyond Iceland, where it, it's typically been on both sides a completely traded market. Um, and, and that it doesn't best suit addressing the long-term issues. So for us, it's about working with fewer people on a longer-term basis. Thank you very much. Let's move on to a question in the middle. Thank you. Could you just explain who you are and where you're from, please? Hi, um, I'm Sam Royston. I'm from DEFRA. I'm part of the Food Data Transparency Partnership team. And I think, you know, this morning we, we heard and we all know in this room that the economic arguments for transforming our food system are evident, but... What we're he hearing from many of the food businesses at the moment is that, you know, the short in the short term, their focus is on reducing prices, but keeping prices low for consumers, and it's not the right time to be looking at these long-term environmental, animal welfare, health issues. And I just wondered what your perspective was, um, yeah, as sort of a retailer that is a, a value retailer. I, I I completely understand that perspective. Um, it doesn't surprise me um, when I when I see what I see on a daily basis within the supply chain, um, I think it, it's one of those issues where we just have to find time um, to do both. I think it's, it's really, but it's really easy and understandable why people feel they can't. I think, that, I think the challenge is to tr try and find as many people to find time who, c who can find time and, and keep the door open for those people that right now feel as though they can't. With the, you know, with the hope that actually, as they, as they say it, move forward, they still want to come back in. Thank you. There's a question at the back. Hi, uh, Beth and Grills, editor of Food Manufacture. A lot of food manufacturers would actually say that food prices don't reflect the cost of production. We're obviously in a cost of living crisis right now. So how? Do we actually approach this without penalising people that are struggling? I mean, it is true. If you look at the food you know, input costs for farmers, uh, they're swelling so much more already, aren't they? The cost of production before passing those costs on. Um, well, I, I look, I, I, again, I see the conversations that we have with um, suppliers every single day um, as, we, as we work with them to deal with their rising input costs. I, I think the challenge on what... I, I know our business, and I'm sure every retailer is doing, is what you're trying to do is you're working closely um, to try and understand those costs and work out how you can mitigate them, um, typically through trying to re-engineer and drive out more efficiencies in the, in the product process. What that still leads to, though, is um, some of the cost makes its way through, and we see that in, you know, in food inflation. We see it in all reports about food inflation. So lots of inflation is making its way through, but not as much as at, at, at the start of the process, but that is, that's by supply chain partners working through the most granular level of detail, just trying to engineer out some of that inflation so that it doesn't all get passed on. Thank you. Question at the front. Hi there, and thanks for such a, a thoughtful speech. Um, my name is Matt Towner from Impact on, on Urban Health. We're lucky enough to work with actors across the food system, including companies, to improve people's, people's health. Um, you mentioned that there are, you believe there are limits to singular changes that like fiscal measures, um, the upcoming HFSS uh, promotional restrictions, for example. Um, I guess I wondered whether you kind of acknowledge them as part of an overall range of measures that are really important to, to shifting diets. And, and I ask that because the evidence base, I guess, tells us that prices and promotions are such important levers for affecting the, the healthiness of what people are buying. And we've seen um, you know, recent evidence from the University of Cambridge showing that 5,000 girls a year in year six are sort of uh, avoiding obesity as a result of the soft drinks industry levy. And there's lots of evidence to say that promotions are driving customers to buy more unhealthy products and spend more, over, spend more overall than if they weren't in place. So I just wanted to... Wanted to, wanted to uh, the, the simple answer to that is yes. Um, so I, I think 
on, on, on both aspects. So one, I think it, it is really important that it's in the, it, it has to be within the context of a range of measures and it has to be more joined up. We don't always see that on this on the specific price promotions, but um, we're not unsupportive of that. It's just a question of would you do it right now, today, in the middle of a cost of living crisis? And, and we don't think that's the right thing to do in, in, in today, right now. If we were sitting so here having the same conversation. So when, when we face, for example, well, if, if inflation set to I, fall um, later this year to around you know, 4%, for example, uh, is that when if, you should do it? If we were it? sitting having this conversation this time next year, it would probably be a different conversation. But, but would, you, would you set it and do it today in the context of how people are struggling? We think that's a fair question to ask. Okay, thank you. Just one more question. There's a question at the back. And then we're going to move on to the panel. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Ruth from Sustain, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. I was really interested to hear you talk about the polluter pays and wanting to see polluters shoulder more of the burden for pollution. There were calls last week for retailers to pay to clean up the River Y. And I'm just wondering how you, if you could explain how you think that should work. So who should be shouldering the, the pay for the um, environmental and particularly biodiversity impact of industrial meat? Should that be the retailer? Should it be the international corporation that controls the production, so Cargill or Avara Foods in the UK? Or should it be the farmer? Obviously, we don't want to see that be the farmer. It should be one of the companies who are benefiting but not seeing the impact of the pollution in communities. So could you explain a little bit more about that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I look, I, think extended producer responsibility is probably a good example as a reference point for that. We, we've, we've come from a system where um, uh, with two, two main issues in it. Number one, um, the polluter didn't pay. So the existing PRN system that extended producer responsibility will, will replace actually didn't cover the full costs of collection, recycling um, and dealing with materials. Um, so the work that's been done to actually um, clarify and understand that total cost is, is a really important start point. And then secondly, and it's it's an interesting, you're, there are different perspectives on whether you do a shared supply chain, which was the system as is, where depending on what part you were in the supply chain, you you paid a portion of the costs um, through to um, the extended produce responsibility piece, which um, effectively moves it all to the person that places the product on the market. Both models have their merits from the po that point of view, but the important bit is actually the work up front that says um, this cost exists and, and needs to be borne to address this issue, and this and the supply chain um, that is responsible for it is ultimately responsible for it. They, you know that that principle being established, then actually whether it's shared or or not to some extent is just a mechanism. But the, the it's the bit that says this cost needs to be borne and will be borne by that supply chain and, and establishing that. And, and I think the challenge around wider envi environmental issues is to do that. Otherwise, it, you know, it just becomes, you know, it's, it's sort of factual that it's there, but it's not yet being addressed. <coughs> That's where we need um, uh, the sort of, I, g I guess, the, um, it's beyond carbon accounting into wider environmental accounting to be borne on product. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you so much uh, for your speech and also all your responses to those questions. I really appreciate it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you.